Welcome to this lecture on indifference curves, where we look at some of the advanced features of the basic model of indifference curve analysis. Within our standard analysis, we say that there's certain assumptions built into the model. More is preferred to less. Convexity, the, the preferences are complete, and they're also transitive. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at these non-standard cases. We're going to mess with some of these assumptions, like the first couple, where more is preferred to less and convexity. We're also going to look at non-standard budget constraints as well. So we have non-standard indifference curves and non-standard uh, budget constraints. And so we get little advances within the basics of this model. So first up is to realize that this is what the basic model really would look like, where we have uh, the indifference curve being convex uh, to the origin here, and we have a straight budget constraint. This is what we normally kind of think of as the standard optimization within indifference curve analysis. But here is our first example into the foray of a little bit different shapes of everything going on. What happens when we have an indifference curve where one of our goods is a bad and the other is a good, right? So in economics, the good can be returning negative utility. That could be a bad. So think of something like trash or something, right? So we have uh, two different goods, one that's a good, one that's a bad. What does our indifference curve look like when we have such a situation as this? Well, here we're gonna lose our convexity to the origin. Give it a chance and maybe pause the video and try and see what your guess would be as to what this indifference curve looks like. With the knowledge that you currently have, you can think about it. What shape would my curve be if at all points along that curve, I remained indifferent? What we have here is an indifference curve that shows a bad on the vertical axis and a good on the horizontal axis. What we can think about with this is we could imagine two different points uh, along this curve here. So if we started right here at this point A and we move up to this point B, right? If good A is a bad, or if, if, if the Y variable is a bad, right? And we start at the point A, if you give me some more of the bad, right? What do you have to do to leave me indifferent from the original situation, from the original you know, point A situation. What do you have to do to keep me indifferent in that situation? Well, you have to give me some of the good then. If you're gonna give me some bad, you gotta give me some good to offset it. If you give me enough of the good, it could offset the bad, the increase from the bad, the increase in the y-axis. And so we can imagine a indifference curve that is shaped something like this. And you will notice with this setup of the good and the bad, right? normally we have uh, within standard indifference curve analysis to the northeast makes us better off. Well, when one of the goods is a bad here and we're going with non-standard indifference curve analysis, right? what do we have to do here? Now what we want to do is we want to go to the south and east. right? And why would that be? Why do we want to head to the south and east? Well, because the east is giving us more of the good and the south is giving us less of the bad, right? And so we'd actually be made better off this way. Now, we don't usually do stuff like this with indifference curves where we have a good and a bad. So we don't really have to worry about this. Generally, we keep all of our assumptions within the standard microeconomic theory that we showed at the start of this lecture. And the reason for that is what we can often do is just say this isn't really a bad we can make it into a good by having the absence of the bad right so instead of analyzing trash versus some other good what we do is we analyze the absence of trash versus some other good and then that gives us our standard indifference curve analysis and we don't have to worry about the bad right so we can just look at the normal indifference curve analysis but we just wanted to get us thinking about what a bad would look like to get us in this realm of thinking about different shapes of indifference curves. So now let's go to some of the more standard different shapes of indifference curves. And let's think about perfect complements. So here we have perfect complements. We can imagine 
if we had uh, the consumption of left shoes and right shoes, that these could be perfect complements. Let's imagine that neither of them is a bad at this point in time. So getting a bunch of extra right shoes, well, it doesn't help you, but it also doesn't bother you. It doesn't take up space in your closet or something like that, that you have a slight preference away from or anything like that. We're just totally indifferent to it. So let's start here at this point with two left shoes and two right shoes. If we get another right shoe, say we move out to here, right? But we keep two left shoes, we're no happier. We're indifferent between this new point and the original point, right? And if we get yet another right shoe, all three of these marks, we are indifferent between because we only have two left shoes. So we can only make two pairs and then we have two pairs and a bunch of extra right shoes. It doesn't really matter. So our indifference curve would suggest that the more and more right shoes that we got, it doesn't matter as long as we only have two left shoes, we're still indifferent between the situation. Now the same exact thing can be said if we kept two right shoes, but we got say an additional left shoe. Well, we would be indifferent to that situation. If we had a third left shoe and just two right shoes, we're indifferent between that and just having two and two. Why? Because the only thing that makes us happy is when we have a pair, when we have both the left and the right shoe. These goods are perfect complements. They, you only get benefit when you have both of them together, right? And we could keep doing that uh, same example that we could go forevermore up along this indifference curve that if we kept on getting more and more left shoes, it doesn't matter, we're still indifferent as long as we stay at this two right shoes amount, right? So that's our idea of uh, perfect complements in this situation. Here we have close complements. It's close to that perfect complements picture where we have that right angle there, right? It's very close. The closer we get to that right angle, the closer we are to having perfect complements. These are two goods that are pretty much complements with each other. They almost have to always be consumed together according to this individual's preference, but not completely. Uh, so you could think of an example of this as having like bagels on the y-axis and cream cheese on the x-axis here. They're close to perfect complements. The closer to that right angle we get, the more they're close, more closely they are to perfect complements. The flatter they are, the less so. Which that takes us to perfect substitutes. So we could imagine our preference for two goods, say nickels and dimes. Uh, we could say that, hey, I really don't care if I have two nickels or if I have one dime, or if I have 20 nickels or one dime. So what this does is this gives us a perfectly flat indifference curve. This is not our budget constraint. This is our indifference curve. This is showing us our preferences, right? We're indifferent between any of these spots, between having 10 dimes and zero nickels, or having five dimes and 10 nickels, or having 20 nickels and zero dimes. We're indifferent between any of those. We don't care about having extra loose change and having more nickels than dimes or anything like that. If we were totally indifferent, we would have this perfectly flat, line with an equal slope throughout. This is an example of perfect substitutes. When the line is perfectly flat like this, we have these perfect substitutes. Here we have close substitutes, right? So we could think of two goods that are almost perfect trade-offs at some ratio. It doesn't have to be one-to-one -one with each other, but you know, as we get more and more of one, it's still basically a similar substitute to that other good as we go throughout. Uh, so an example of this could be like Granny Smith apples and Fuji apples. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of a difference to me. Uh, I might like one more than the other, but almost throughout my consumption at any quantities, you know, I have this ratio of Granny Smith to Fuji apples that I'm willing to trade off with one another. They're very close to substitutes. It might be that it's one Fuji apple to one Granny Smith apple, but it might also be that it's two Granny Smith apples to one Fuji apple, but it's always that way. It's close to this perfect substitutes 
thing, just like with the nickels and dimes. It doesn't have to be at the same ratio, right? But what it is, is it's that flatness of the indifference curve here. So this is close substitutes, close to perfect substitutes. Here we're gonna go back to perfect complements to look at one other thing we can do with these kind of non-standard indifference curves. Let's try and show the substitution and income effect if we have a situation where we have perfect complements and the price of, in this case, one of the goods being right shoes gets cut in half. So we change the price of one good, we have perfect complements, how do we show the substitution and income effect? Right. You can pause the video here and give it a whirl yourself if you're comfortable with the substitution and income effect and try and see what the answer is. You kind of have to trust yourself if you know what you're doing because your answer might seem a little bit odd. All right, so the first thing that you have to do is if right shoes cut in half with price, right? We originally could get four. Now we're gonna shift out right shoes to being able to purchase eight if we got nothing but right shoes. So we notice a rotation in our budget constraint. Then what we do is we take the new budget constraint slope, the new price ratio that we had, right? Which would be this yellow highlighted area. We take that new slope and what we do is we take that new slope and what we do is we trace that down here and that's where this line comes in, that sub line, right? We take that new slope and we see where it just kisses that old indifference curve, where it's just tangent to that old indifference curve. That tells us at their old levels of consumption, if we faced a different price ratio, the price ratio of the substitution line, how much would we consume? How much would we change our consumption given our preferences? Well, in this case, it's going to hit that same corner, that same spot, that same combination of two left shoes and two right shoes. And so our substitution effect is nothing. We move from A to B. Well, there's no change from the substitution effect with perfect complements in this setup. But then what we do is we take that substitution line and we shift it out. We do a parallel shift of that substitution line out back to the uh, original place where it was, that new budget constraint, a parallel shift is just a, like a change in income. So it's representing the income effect. It's as though, okay, we have this price ratio, but now if we have this price ratio and we're wealthier, so we can shift that substitution line out in a way, it's very similar to getting more wealth or more income, right? Now we're at that new budget constraint, that solid thick purple line, and we see where that just kisses the indifference curve. And that's our new point of our of consumption given that constraint and so the income effect is the move from b to c right and so all our change in this case is income effect there's no substitution effect and all income effect okay so what we're going to do now is look at other shape relationships and this shape relationship that we're going to look at is when you have a strong preference towards one of the goods versus the other good, right? So what if you're in a situation where you have two trade-offs, trade-off between peaches and oranges? Well, I really like oranges, but I don't really like peaches. They're good, they're not a bad to me, but mm, I just, they're not really my thing. How do we draw on difference curves in that situation? Well, the example that we're gonna use uh, comes from uh, a famous paper in economics, The Prisoner of War, uh, paper uh, where Radford does this story of how markets arose in a prisoner of war camp. And one thing that he showed was that there was markets for tea and coffee. But the English within that situation preferred tea and the French preferred coffee. Well, how would we represent that within our indifference curve analysis, right? What kind of, what would our, what would be different about our standard normal indifference curve if we had, say, a preference towards tea, we'll put tea on the y-axis and coffee on the x-axis. You can go ahead and pause now and try and give it a, a, a whirl, see if you can figure this out, but that's what we're gonna look at here. What happens when you have a strong preference? So here we have the British indifference curve. They don't really care much about coffee. This is showing a very strong preference in this case and they really prefer to have tea. 
right? So if we look at two points somewhere along this curve, so say we start right here at point A, right? If I give up just a, a, a sip of tea, right? If I gave up just a sip of tea, what would you have to give me in order to leave me indifferent? Oh, you would have to give me a whole lot of coffee, right? If I was British, giving up from this point A just a little bit of T, right? We're going down on the y-axis, right? To leave me indifferent, which is what an indifference curve is showcasing, you would have to give me a lot on the x-axis, a lot of coffee, because I don't like coffee anywhere near as much as I like tea. And so we get this little swoosh-like symbol, uh, uh, kind of just usually we kind of end it right here and then just kind of down, and then it's, it can never come back up, right? That won't work. It's always got to be uh, decreasing there, but it's going to be uh, kind of this flat and pointed towards the good that we like here, pointed towards the British liking the tea more. And then we can infer from that what happens for the French, right? So here we have the indifference curve for the French. It's pointing again towards the good that they actually like. You should be able to explain why in a similar fashion to what I just did there. Pick two points, say here and here, right? And you can say, okay, between these two points, right? If you uh, started at point A, right? And you took away just a little bit of my coffee, right? You would have to replace it with a whole bunch of tea because I don't really like tea that much and I really like coffee, right? So moving from A to B is just a small decrease in coffee to leave me indifferent, you need to give me a bunch of tea. All right, so what we've done so far is we've looked at kind of non-normal preferences or unique uh, different advances in our preferences, so different shapes to our indifference curves. Here, what we're gonna add in is a few things where we look at non-linear budget constraints. So first up, we're gonna look at gifts in kind, and then quickly we will just kind of go through kinks within our budget constraints. So for this example, what we're gonna look at is policy regarding uh, education, right? This is what we're really gonna look at. So we're gonna compare education to all other goods, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna imagine a situation where originally we consume certain amount of education. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume normal preferences to start. So we're gonna do two different policies and two different types of preferences. So we'll end up with four graphs here. This would be our starting point for our normal preference graph with a policy of a subsidy. So if this is our starting point, and if we subsidize education, we would get this new budget constraint over here, the blue budget constraint, okay? And what that would do for us, given our preferences, just kind of standard preferences, is we would increase our consumption a fair amount, right? So we would increase our education. Why would our picture look like this? Well, if we subsidized education, right, are we capable of consuming more of all other goods than we were in the first situation when our budget constraint uh, was just this original black line here? Can we get more of all other goods? No, we can't. So we're still up here. But if we spent all of our money on education, does it stop at the original budget constraint point? It's no, because it's subsidized. So now we can move further out in terms of education. Well, that exists all, for all of these points throughout. And so what we can do is we can create this new budget constraint here. Given the shape of our kind of standard normal preferences, we end up just seeing different tangencies and we move out in education and we also increase our all of our goods a little bit. Okay, that's kind of a normal case. So this here is a situation where we subsidize education and we have kind of normal preferences. Now let's look at a policy where we have a gift in kind, right? This particular gift in kind is a gift of education. Often in policy, we would call that type of educational policy a voucher for education. It can't be used for anything else other than education. So it's a gift in kind. It's not a gift in just income so that you can go and consume more education. It's not a subsidy towards education. It's a little, you know, uh, ticket that says, here's two free years of education or whatever it is, right? Uh, so we could get a voucher for education. 
Well, we can think about our original budget constraint, right, is existing, and then we get our tangency, and this is our original consumption point of education and all other goods. But then we put, with these normal preferences, we put a voucher in place. Now, with a voucher in place, we know at the extreme of education, we could get more education. We could spend all of our money on education, plus we could spend the voucher. We also know that we couldn't get any more of all other goods. If we spent all of our money on all other goods, we can't get more on, of all other goods by spending a voucher on it because the voucher is only for education. Right? But we don't just draw a straight line between these two like we would with a subsidy. Why? Because what we could do is spend all of our money on education or on all other goods, right? Like we just did there. We could spend all of our money on that, but then also spend the two year voucher or spend whatever the voucher is on education. So we could get the same amount of all other goods that we got originally when we spent all of our money on all other goods, plus we could get some education, how much ever the voucher was for, right? So we could get to these two kind of points are part of our budget constraint. And now what we can do from here is we can realize that, well, what's the relative price ratio of all other goods versus education after we have spent all of our voucher? Well, the price ratio after that point is the same as it originally was. There's no difference in the ratio between the price of all other goods and education after we've already used the voucher in its entirety. And so we get the same slope with the budget constraint, uh, with the new budget constraint with the voucher as what we had originally with no policy whatsoever. So we get this kind of second budget constraint here, this blue line that we have and what we do is we see where it's just tangent to an indifference curve. We pick out that indifference curve and we call that indifference curve two here, the indifference curve that we have with this voucher policy. And again, we can show an increase in the quantity of education that we consume and also a little increase in all other goods. We could make it so that those, the increase was exactly the same as the subsidy, uh, but we just, we see an increase in education and an increase in all other goods. That's all we need for our analysis here. Now let's imagine a little different story. Here, what we have is very strong preferences, right? So here we're going to do the same thing. We're going to look at a subsidy and we're going to look at a voucher, but now instead of having normal preference, we're going to have strong preferences towards all other goods. A lot of times when we do education policy, we're not really worried about the people who consume normal amounts of education. What we're trying to do is get education to those who maybe have the least amount of access to it, but also maybe those who have the least preference towards it. Uh, their current trade-offs are such that they don't invest a lot in education. So we're trying to actually have policy that impacts those kind of people, the kind of people that have indifference curves shaped like I1 and I2 here, right? So let's look at what the subsidy does. When the subsidy moves the budget constraint out to the new budget constraint, the blue line here, what happens to the quantity that we consume? Well, we can look at the two optimal points and it's so close to each other and it's so jumbled that we barely get any change whatsoever. And the reason for this is you're subsidizing each unit purchased by these people who don't want to purchase education. And so by giving them a little bit of a subsidy, a little bit of a break on the price, they still just don't want to get very much of it. And so we get very little increase in education, right? And what we get is a very small increase in all other goods as well. Basically this policy does very little for those who have a preference away from education and towards all other goods. So when we subsidize it, very little happens. But with the vouchers, look what happens. We can look at the optimal points and very similar shape in difference curves here. And what happens is because we don't just have this rotation, we have this entire gap here, this jetting out, where our indifference curve is going to hit is likely going to be just right on that corner or very close to that corner. So what we end up with is actually a pretty big increase in education. If I give you two free years of education and you can't spend it on anything else, I am going to still purchase a whole bunch of all other goods, 
but I am also going to just consume that two years of education. So I can make it so that the person who has a preference away from education at least gets some minimal amount. It increases by at least, or at least out to that amount, amount that I gave them with the voucher for free because, well, they can't do anything else with that voucher. And so this is by no means a proof that we should have vouchers in education or anything like that. There's lots of other factors to consider here, but this it does show us some of the power of using indifference curves and using these non-standard uh, shapes of preferences and budget constraints in helping us think about policy issues and what will actually happen when people face, say, changes in constraints or if they have certain shaped preferences or things like that. We can analyze what is likely to happen within the situation, and we can make smarter decisions about the policies that we have. One final non-standard budget constraint thing that we want to consider here is a change in the slope of the budget constraint called a kink, right? So sometimes what we end up with is we have the price of some good uh, changes at a certain level of consumption or uh, you know, you get a frequent buyer discount or different things like that, or maybe we, we have different stoppages. We can get different types of kinks within our uh, budget constraints. So here we can just imagine that we have two goods, weights and boxes, and we can just pretend that this is this one-to-one -one ratio between these two, right, that we have as the price ratio. And so we, you know, it doesn't really matter where we consume or anything like that, but we could draw in some indifference curve and say, okay, you know, here's our level of indifference when we optimize. But really we're looking at the budget constraint here. What would happen if after, you know, and halfway through uh, of our consumption of boxes, so after we consumed uh, 20 units of boxes, right? what happens if the price cuts in half? Okay, well, let's look at this. If the price of boxes cuts in half, after we consume 20 units, right? Our budget constraint after 20 units would no longer be that solid black line that was back there. Why? Because the price of a box now is, well, it's half as much, so we can get more boxes. So if our budget constraint used to go, say, out to 30 units, right? Now it's gonna go out to 40 units. So we're going to be able to uh, kind of uh, increase the consumption or the, the potential consumption of boxes if our indifference curve would somehow hit in these points over here. Now, our indifference curve as we originally drew it up maybe is hitting up here and this won't matter at all. We'll still consume less than the 20, right? But it could be the case that we really prefer uh, to consume a lot of boxes and what we end up with is you know, we get some indifference curve that does take advantage of this reduced price after the uh, change in price from the consuming more than 20 rule here, right? Which would then allow us to get to a higher indifference curve because of the discount than the original situation where we don't have that discount, we don't get that red budget constraint, right? So here you can just see that if the price at some point in time changes, we will get a kink in the budget constraint. It could kink back, so maybe it is after 20 that boxes get more expensive. Well, then that would look something like this. Or it could be like the situation we drew here where boxes get cheaper and it kinks out. And so you can think about lots of different shapes with budget constraints and different offers that companies give for different elements of different pricing schemes giving different patterns of consumption. All right, that has been Indifference Curves, the advanced basics. Uh, thank you very much for paying attention. This has been a presentation by Michael Clark.